was a beautiful song. Thank you for sharing that. Our scripture reading is found in Psalms 46, um, 1 through 3 today. I'm reading from the New King James Version. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Um, I want to just say that the title of the sermon that's in the bulletin is, is a little wrong. I left out a few words when I sent them to Lisa. So that's the actual title, um, Better Than Light and Safer Than a Known Way. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let your words from my mouth bring us all hope. In your name I pray, amen. Okay. <laughs> now I have to learn new technology, sorry. Okay, maybe I don't. Okay. <laughs> this is my life in school every day. I have all this technology that's supposed to work and it's just like, ah, okay. In a minute I'm gonna say forget it, but. <laughs> yeah, I got it, it's on. That always happens too. Arrow down. Arrow down. <laughs> okay, starting over. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. <clears throat> it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Can anyone tell me where these lines come from? Anyone know? Yes, Tale of Two Cities. All right. If you know that, then you know that this comes out of the French Revolution. Charles Dickens famous novel about the French Revolution. He is describing a time that some of you may know something about. Maybe you've read about it, maybe you've read other books or studied it. And yet, if we really pay attention to those words, we can see that he could be describing our life right now. The best of times, the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. Sounds like 2020 to me. And I'm not just talking about politics. <laughs> I'm talking about those of you with kids and those of you working with kids or grown-ups. I'm talking about life, my life, your life. You know it's true. Our lives are full of contradictions and paradoxes, of good days and bad days, of peace and contentment one minute, of devastation and loss the next. Now this makes life interesting, but too often it makes it confusing and frustrating and miserable and maybe even unbearable. Sometimes we wonder what in the world is going on and how we're ever going to figure it out if we can. Nothing makes sense, nothing goes right, nothing and no one is fair, right? And yet you know too, even though we don't like to admit it, that many times we forget that it's on us how we see things. That we have a choice about our attitude, about finding our way to make sense out of our lives. We forget that we do have control over our emotions. 
we do have control over our responses to the situations life puts in front of us. We do have a choice whether we see our lives as the best of times or the worst of times. We do have a choice. One of my favorite speeches to teach is Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. We usually hear all or parts of it at least once a year around the time of his birth, um, his birthday a couple weeks ago. Um, I've studied and taught the speech many, many times, but I always hear something new and important, something that catches my ear in a way it never had before. Recently, I was watching the speech for the hundredth time at least, when I heard something that I knew I wanted to share with you all at some point. It's nestled in the several lines that begin with a phrase that gives the speech its favorite ty famous title, I have a dream. You all know how it goes. He's talking about his vision of a dramatic change in the way we treat each other, the way we look for quality in our fellow human beings. He says that he has a dream. Oops. No, I... Uh, I have to, okay. He says that I have a dream that one day his four little children will be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. The content of their character. Maybe because one of the things we try to do here at Thunderbird is teach character. Those words all but jump out at me each time I see or hear them. King says that we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. And Ellen White, in her iconic book, Education, reminds us that every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the creator. Individuality, power to think and to do. The men and women in whom this power is developed are the men and women who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. It is the work of true education. Thank you. It is the work of true education to develop this power, to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. Instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let students be directed to the sources of truth, to the vast fields open for research in nature and revelation. Let them contemplate the great facts of duty and destiny and the mind will expand and strengthen. Instead of educated weaklings, institutions of learning may send forth men and women strong to think and to act. Men and women who are masters and not slaves of circumstances. Men and women who possess breadth of mind, clearness of thought, and the courage of their convictions. Such an education provides more than mental discipline. It provides more than physical training. It strengthens the character so that truth and uprightness are not sacrificed to selfish desire or worldly ambition. It fortifies the mind against evil. Instead of some master passion becoming a power to destroy, every motive and desire are brought into conformity to the great principles of right. As the perfection of his character is dwelt upon, the mind is renewed and the soul is recreated in the image of God. What education can be higher than this? What can equal it in value? Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness, is the goal to be reached. Before every student, before the student, there is open a path of continual progress. Each has an object to achieve, a standard to attain. That includes everything good and pure and noble. Each will advance as fast and as far as possible in every branch of true knowledge. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation 
for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to humanity. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. It's powerful words. There are so many implications for each of us in this description of Christian education, as well as in that little phrase from Martin Luther King's speech about the content of our character. They have everything to do with the way our days end up being, either the best of times or the worst of times. King's phrase asks us to look beyond the surface when we look at each other. It says that superficial qualities are not what are essential in a life. It implies that we need to look at the heart rather than the outward appearance, the color of one's skin. That we need to see each other through God's eyes. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. But that much is obvious, I think. What may not be obvious, but what is equally important, if not more so, is how imperative it is that there is something of quality inside to see if and when others get beyond the surface. In other words, the quality of our character counts. If we want, to see, if we want others to see and know us for what we are inside, shouldn't what's inside be worth seeing and knowing? A rhetorical question, I think. The answer has to be yes, but it's not so academic or easy to actually accomplish. And yet it's something that we absolutely must accomplish if we want our lives to be the best of times instead of the worst of times. Christian education includes character development as an integral part of its curriculum. At Thunderbird, we are intentional, intentional about this, and no doubt so too is TCE and the others of our schools around this conference and this whole North American division. But character development needs to go beyond the classroom, and it needs to go beyond school age. It needs to be, in fact, the worth, work of a lifetime, of our lifetime. Another of my favorite things to teach comes out of Chaim Potok's book, The Chosen. It's a story of a Jewish boy and his father living in Brooklyn during World War II. At the heart of the book, Reuven's father talks with his son about making his character count and the importance of doing it now. He reminds his son and us, the readers, that human beings do not live forever. We live less time than it takes to blink an eye if we measure our lives against eternity. So, you may ask, what value is there to a human life? There is so much pain in the world. What does it mean to have to suffer so much if our lives are nothing more than the blink of an eye? Actually, the blink of an eye is something. Uh, uh, is nothing, but the blink of the eye that blinks, that is something. A span of life is nothing, but the person who lives that span, that person is something. You can fill that tiny span with meaning. So its quality is immeasurable, though its quantity may be insignificant. Do you understand what I'm saying? You must fill your life with meaning. Meaning is not automatically given to life. It is hard work to fill one's life with meaning. So, what kind of meaning do you think you are supposed to fill your life with? The Bible has a number of answers for us. You've probably heard them many times in school, in church, in worships, in sermons. Maybe even some of the books you've had to read as an assignment or chosen to read for your own devotions. All of those answers take us back to Jesus, to putting Jesus first in our lives. In Matthew 10, 24 and 25, Jesus is in the midst of a conversation with his disciples. He's been showing and telling them about the meaning of discipleship throughout the whole book of Matthew. And here he brings them and us to the crux of the matter. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher 
and a servant like his master. Now, Jesus' statement implies that his disciples need to be like him. In essence, Jesus, Martin Luther King, Ellen White, and Reuben's father are saying the same thing, that we must fill our lives with meaning, that we must make our characters count. And if we are Christians, this meaning is directly related to our relationship with Jesus. It's not as easy as this, of course. It takes time and effort to fill our lives with meaning. It means realizing that we are responsible for our words and our actions, that there are risks involved in being a part of humanity, of a community, and consequences too. It means being mature enough to make wrong decisions and accepting the discipline that comes with being caught in that wrong decision. It means being honest with others, but more importantly, with ourselves. <clears throat> it means be being vulnerable to hurt, yes, but also to life and to friendship and the wonderful strength that it can bring to our lives. If you cannot do these things, Reuben's father tells him, your life has no depth, no value. Merely to live, merely to exist, what sense is there to that? A fly also lives. The Apostle Paul has a lot to say about the meaning we should fill our lives with, about the content of our characters. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about that. He states that as Christians, we need to be patient and kind, that we should not be envious or conceited, that we should not be rude or easily provoked. <clears throat> he says we should think no evil and should not rejoice when others are in trouble. In Galatians 5, he reminds us that if the Holy Spirit is directing our lives, we will be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In Philippians 4, he tells us that we should fill our minds with whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good, virtuous, and praiseworthiness. He says, think about these things. And in Colossians 3, he tells us to demonstrate tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience towards others. He says we should bear with one another, forgive one another, love one another, and let the peace of God rule our hearts. He says to be thankful, to teach and encourage one another, and to sing with grace in our hearts. Well, I can hear you thinking, it's all well and good to read these texts. It's all well and good to agree that we must make good choices in our lives, that we must guard our character, that we must be like this and act like that. But you and I both can tell each other, too, from our own experiences, that it's impossible to do this on our own. And that's why we have additional texts with promises, like Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there are scores more texts that encourage us in our character development and assure us that we are not alone in our best and our worst of times. And here are just some of them. Psalm 46, 1 to 3, which is our scripture. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. <clears throat> Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Exodus 15.2 
The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Psalm 9, 9, and 10. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 34, 10. Those who seek the Lord lack nothing. Isaiah 26, 3, which is my mom's favorite text. Uh, Those of steadfast mind you keep in peace because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord you shall have an everlasting rock. Psalm 32, 7. The Lord is my hiding place. He will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Exodus 33, 14. The Lord's presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Deuteronomy 31, 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 33:27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Oh, now I went too far, sorry. <laughs> okay. There it is. Psalm 34, 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Well, I could go on, but my technology will really make us all crazy. So I will just recommend the Bible to you. It's full of similar promises and scenarios about the strength we can find when we commit our character to God. Today, I want to challenge each of you to take a close look at your life. Maybe even this afternoon, if you have a quiet moment or two, examine your character. Ask yourself if there is quality there. Ask yourself if there is any meaning in your present and positive purpose to your future. A card at your life, at your days. Have you made the most of them? Look to see if there isn't anything more you can do to be the best you can be and to present Jesus and his character in the best possible life to those you witness to, wherever and however that might be. Then take a close look at who is walking there beside you. With God's love and protection and the encouragement and support of friends and family, teachers and fellow church members, how can you help but find meaning in your life and add quality to the lives of all you meet? My students know that I like quotes, and some of you are here. Uh, you might work, rec- remember that from our morning journal writing. I usually share a handful of quotes that I think are interesting and thought-provoking to give them something to write about and think about at the beginning of our days together. One of the quotes that I have long treasured and used frequently throughout the years comes from M.L. Haskins' book, The Desert. I read it over on a regular basis, so I will be reminded of the only way I can fill my life with meaning, the only way I can develop the content of my character more than anything else. It goes like this. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God. That will be to you better than light and safer than a known way. Now this in turn reminds me of an old song. Well, well, maybe I shouldn't say old. From my teenage years, not so old. Uh, Some of you might remember with me was that song that said, put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Remember that? Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can see others differently. 
Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. My prayer for each of you is that you will not be afraid to put your hand in God's. And if you do, you will be safe. You will know more happiness than confusion and despair. You will look at others differently, and they will see you for the content of your character that reflects not you, but Jesus. Not only that, but when you examine your days, you will see that instead of the best of times and the worst of times, they will only be the best of times. <clears throat> because when you walk hand in hand with God, that will be better than light and safer than a known way.